Welcome. Thank you for joining us for another online program from the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Antigone Ladd, and I'm delighted to be your host this evening. Let me ask if you are watching this program on Facebook, please click on the like button and also share our video if you wouldn't mind. If you're watching us on YouTube, on the other hand, please take a few minutes to subscribe to YouTube and then also ring the bell. These are new elements I've just recently learned about from the social media, and they will help us to increase our viewership. So thank you very much for doing that. If you wanna help support the Historical Society in its programming and in building its new museum and education center, there is a donate button at the bottom of your screen. So thank you for watching us and thank you for going through all of these logistical issues with the social media. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening, who is John Winkleman. John is a licensed battlefield guide here in Gettysburg since 2004. John retired here to Gettysburg in 2000. He is a U.S. Navy veteran having served in Vietnam, and he's also worked in private industry. But his passion now is Civil War history. John has done an extensive job on researching the taverns of Adams County, which he talked about in an earlier program several months ago. If you would like to review that one, it talks about the history of taverns in general, why they sprang up, and how important they were to the developing economy and the terrible road system that was existing back in the 17 and early 1800s. Tonight, he's going to take a very different view and talk to us about the Civil War coming to Gettysburg and how the marching armies coming into Gettysburg took advantage of those taverns. And does he have the stories? But I'd like to introduce you to John by asking him a question about how he collected this research. The information on taverns is very sparse and clearly not in any one location. And once he got started on looking for this, how did he decide how many taverns to include in his research? So John, would you tell us a little bit about how you got into the details of finding old photographs, old records, and then deciding to keep going and adding more and more and more taverns and inns to your study. When you started, how did you decide how many taverns to include and where have you gone since? <laughs> well, actually, we, we never had a set number to begin with. It was just like a program for the Civil War, like explained in the first part. Um, so I was just going to get a number of taverns, see what I could do. And then that's when I found out there is no big tavern book. And Dr. Gladfelter said we could start digging. So my view, at least initially, was maybe do the Confederates coming into Adams County coming down the Chambersburg Pike and some of the taverns in Gettysburg. And uh, that took a while because like they said, there's a lot of information, but it's not all in one spot. So you have to kind of go through records of damage claims, applications, even newspaper clippings, advertisements, whatever. But I got that done. And then Dr. Gladfelter said, well, would you like to continue? So I said, we could maybe keep moving farther east. So we'll go down the York Pike. So we went down, we did uh, New, uh, New Oxford, Cross Keys, Abbottstown. So right now, probably I would say today's Route 30 corridor, we've got pretty much those old taverns, pretty much uh, we've got them, you know, logged, got some information. There's a few that we have missed. We know... One of the big problems is a lot of times with these applications, um, if they they put in an application, but they don't say where it is. And of course, a lot of these taverns, the proprietor, the guy who's running the tavern has the license, but he doesn't own the building. And so sometimes it's hard to match up the proprietor with where he's at. So there's a few out there. We know they had a license. They're out on the York Pike or the Chambersburg Pike. We just don't know where they were. Uh, also, another thing, probably the worst thing when you get into the Civil War era, is that um, from 1851 through the Civil War years, there is no, we don't have the original applications. Those were lost. I mean, Dr. Gladfelter said he looked for them, other people from the Historical Society has looked for them, but 
the original applications are gone. Now we know there is a, a listing that was actually published in the papers of those establishments or those individuals that got uh, approval for a tavern license. We even know what township they were in. We just don't know <laughs> where they were. So some of them it's easy because it's the same person getting his application renewed. But if another guy pops up, well, where's he at? You know, and did somebody maybe, you know, stop operating it or move on and somebody took over for him or what? So it's a lot of detective work trying to find that. In some cases, there are gaps. You don't know who who was there at the time, especially during uh, 1863. We know there's some taverns out there that had been taverns, but they don't have the owner doesn't have the uh, uh, the license. So is he leasing it to somebody? And if he is, who is he leasing it to? So you got to look at this name and try and figure out whether he was over here, or over here. So it becomes almost like instead of just doing research, it's like detective work almost trying to put these over. But I would say uh, the Route 30 corridor is pretty well done. Now, if I want to expand it to go north, south, let's say Littlestown, Biglerville, Bendersville, whatever, McSherry's town, uh, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe we can expand it in the future. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Welcome back. Uh, on our first episode, part one of the historic taverns and inns of Adams County, we explored the early taverns of 18th and 19th century America and here in Adams County. Talked about the importance of taverns, how they were essential to a lot of these early communities. We talked about the tavern keepers, how they needed a license, some of the beverages they would serve. Also, how important the road network was in those days and how it actually the roads would determine where the uh, early taverns would be established. But tonight, we're going to put a little bit of a Civil War spin on everything. Uh, what we're going to do is actually cover the, uh, the march of General John Gordon's Confederate Brigade as he comes into Adams County on June the 26th, 1863. So actually be coming down the old uh, Chambersburg Pike and talking about the inns and taverns that... Uh, he's going to pass and some of the incidents that would occur there. Now, the first tavern we're going to be talking about is the Graffenberg Inn. Uh, Alexander Caldwell will build a log tavern on this site in 1802. This tavern will be built right on the Adams County, uh, Franklin County line. And I mean right on the line. The county line went right through the middle of his tavern. Uh, Caldwell ins would install two bars, one at each end of the tavern. So when the tax collector came in from Adams County, he'd say he sold all his liquor over in Franklin County. And when the Franklin County tax collector arrived, he told him he was selling all his liquor in Adams County. Uh, the story does not tell how long Caldwell got away with this, but he had a plan. Uh, he'll sell his tavern in 1818. Uh, other proprietors will own and operate the inn. But in 1843, David Goodyear will buy the tavern, and he's going to operate this for the next 20 years. Now, the old tavern was made out of logs, but unfortunately, it would be destroyed by a fire in 1849. But Goodyear is going to replace this with a larger two-story uh, brick tavern with 19 rooms plus a large dining room. Because he's actually right on the Chambersburg Pike. And, of course, that became a very important route across the southern Pennsylvania here. And there was a lot of stage traffic, wagon traffic, and so it became a very popular spot. Um, the area continued to grow out here, mainly the Caledonia Ironworks, Thaddeus Stevens' uh, enterprise out here. So people are moving into the area. And uh, in 1849, it was uh, decided to have a post office here, but they had a problem. This place had really no name. The area had no name. And so a gentleman by the name of Edward McPherson, a friend of Thaddeus Stevens, suggested the name uh, Graffenberg. For you students of the battle, uh, this is the same Edward McPherson who owned that town just west of Gettysburg. Uh, the name was actually taken from a famous spa north of Vienna, Austria, and because of the natural springs on Goodyear's property, it seemed like a fitting name. So this becomes the uh, Grafenberg Inn. Now, although Goodyear will own the inn until 1864, he will have various proprietors uh, run it for him. And at the time of the Civil War, Benjamin Shriver was the proprietor. And in 1862, he's going to get a visit by General Jeb Stewart. Stewart in 1862 is going to conduct his second raid around the Army of the Potomac. He came up the Cumberland Valley. He's going to turn east and swing into Adams County. And his men will stop at the inn and uh, help themselves. Mr. Shriver will later submit damage claims for 40 gallons of whiskey, 9 gallons of brandy, 2 gallons of gin. 
Seems like a lot, but in June of 1863, General John Gordon, part of Jubal Early's division, as well as Jubal Early and the rest of the division, will come into Adams County. And the first inn they will hit is the Grafenberg Inn. Now, of course, uh, we know that Jubal Early burnt down Thaddeus Stevens Ironworks. But there was newspaper articles in the Gettysburg Times done in 1941 and 1980 claiming that Early's men burnt down the Grafenberg Inn as well. Now, however, uh, there was an ad in the Gettysburg Compiler from October the 26th, 1863, that lists the inn for sale. And the uh, ad describes the inn in very great detail and mentions nothing about a fire or any damage. And also the fact that Goodyear filed no damage claims for this seems to indicate the, uh, the inn suffered little, if any, damage which would probably be true because if you think about it, Lee had cautioned his, his generals not to destroy private property. Now, Early got rid of the ironworks because it belonged to Thaddeus Stevens, a noted abolitionist, as well as maybe you could argue the iron was helping the Union war effort. But the Grafenberg Inn had nothing to do with the ironworks and it was a private concern. So again, if the, the Inn probably suffered very little, if any, damage. In 1864, Lydia Hostetter will purchase the Inn and after the Civil War, the spring at Grafenberg Inn will become a very popular health resort. Uh, some of the advertisements in those days pretty much advertised that the water from this spring would cure just about everything except death. In 1902, though, the state of Pennsylvania will acquire the inn, but by the 1920s, its popularity has declined, they declined and it's run down. But in 1922, Robert Miller released the inn from the state. He'll put in a golf course, which still exists today out on Route 30. He's going to fix up the inn, and he restores its popularity. The inn continues operating off and on through the 20th century, but in 1970, the state made demands that whoever leased the inn would be responsible for bringing the building up to code. After a three-year restoration, the inn reopened in 1974, but unfortunately, six years later, it would be destroyed by arson on March 15th, 1980. Now, as uh, General Gordon and his brigade are continuing down the Chambersburg Pike, he's going to come to our next tavern in the program here, and this is going to be Newman's Tavern. The picture you see here is actually a photograph taken at the top of the Cashtown Pass, probably early 20th century. Uh, where the buildings are, that was the site of Newman's Tavern. The road coming in from your left is the probably the Lincoln Turnpike or the old Chambersburg Pike and the road leading off to the right today that would be Buchanan Valley Road. Now an Alexander Thompson operated a log tavern on top of what they called at the time Black's Gap. It was known as the uh, Cashtown Pass at the time of the Civil War but he will actually open his tavern there in 1786. In 1790 he's caught operating an illegal tavern or a tippling house, as we found out in our last episode, and he would be fined. But the court was very lenient. He only had to pay the court fees. Thompson will sell his tavern to uh, a John Hahn in 1880, 1802. But in 1884, 1804, David Newman uh, will purchase the tavern, and he will own this tavern until his death in 1864. Now, although Newman will own the tavern for 59 years, uh, most of the time, he's actually leasing it out to other proprietors. And the tavern would be in operation during the Battle of Gettysburg. And there were two newspaper accounts uh, confirming this. It appears that a gentleman by the name of F.D. Smith was the proprietor. And after the battle, he would f uh, actually file a damage claim in 1868 for 30 gallons of whiskey, 4 gallons of brandy, 2 gallons of gin, 3 gallons of wine, and numerous other item items including the bar furniture. So apparently somebody took all the bar stools with them too. Uh, one story in the Gettysburg Compiler states that the wounded Confederate soldier who was shot by the bushwhacker Henry Hahn in the famous bushwhacking incident was taken to Newman's Tavern where he died. Another account said he was taken to Newman's initially but then moved to a tavern in Greenwood and died there. Local historian Tim Smith has researched this incident and found that the Confederate soldier's name was Eli Emick of the 14th Virginia Cavalry. And uh, Emick would have the dubious distinction of being the first Confederate casualty in Adams County during the Gettysburg Campaign. The Star and Sentinel had an article on July 29, uh, 1883, giving account of a Captain Spangler's militia unit. 
Uh, they had been sent out to the Cash Town Pass uh, at the end of June, mainly to cut down some trees and maybe block the path. Uh, they avoided being captured by the 14th Virginia Cavalry. And that night, they would actually go to Newman's and have dinner. And they, it was said that a cavalry trooper, probably one of Captain Bell's cavalry, uh, from his Cav Captain Bell's cavalry company, came in and put $10 on the bar, offering to buy drinks for Spangler's men. He's probably amazed the militiamen were still there after tangling with the 14th Virginia. But uh, Spangler informed the trooper his men did not drink, and they would use the money, however, to pay for their dinner. Now, after David Newman's death in 1864, the building was passed on to his son Ephraim, but was no longer being used as a tavern. There was an article in the Gettysburg Compiler on March the 12th, 1869, that tells of the demise of the old tavern. The old tavern house, widely known in staging times as Newman's on the Chambersburg Pike, just beyond the summit of South Mountain, was destroyed by fire during a severe blowing on Saturday afternoon. Fencing around the house was destroyed, and even a wood close by caught fire. Ephraim Newman lived in the house. It had long ceased being used as a tavern, and uh, shortly before it had been repaired. Ephraim Newman will put another building on the site, and that is the building that is standing there today, which you can see from uh, Route 30 if you look off to the left-hand side. Now, the next building we're going to attack, uh, in, I should say, that we're going to uh, talk about is this one right here. This is the Willow Springs Hotel. Now, a Peter Mertz would receive a tavern license in 1795, and it appears that uh, the tavern was initially made of logs, so the stone part would be uh, added later. Uh, in the 1804 tax record, it said Peter owned 200 acres of land out here, as well as a tavern and a sawmill, so he's been doing pretty good. And uh, his heirs will actually own this tavern until 1841. They'll go through various owners. But in 1855, a uh, man by the name of Benjamin Deardorff will purchase the property, but again, he leases it to others. From 1858 to 1864, Henry Munchhauser will be the proprietor, and he would call his tavern the Willow Springs Hotel. Now, during the Civil War, Munchhauser will be visited twice by the Confederate Army. In October of 1862, Jeb Stewart's men are still heading east through Adams County. They'll stop at his tavern and take liquor, bottles, bridles, 20 bushels of oats. And somebody actually reached into the bar room uh, till draw and took out $35. Bad, but in 1863, uh, during General Lee's invasion, uh, the whole, basically, pretty much all of Lee's army is going to be coming right past his tavern door. And uh, he will actually put in a damage claim for two horses, a wagon, a carriage, 40 bushels of corn, 10 bushels of oats, a grindstone, and 125 gallons of liquor. Also, uh, from June 20th to June 26th, 1863, Munchhauser also boarded and fed Captain Bell's Adams County Cavalry Company, but at least he was reimbursed for their expenses. In 1872 and 1873, F.D. Smith would be the proprietor, and at that time it would be known as the Willow Grove Hotel. Uh, after that, though, by the 1880s, uh, pretty much it had stopped being used as a tavern. But today, the building is still standing on the corner of Bingham Road. So that can still be viewed today if you go down the old Route 30. Now, the next tavern on the route, we're still proceeding southward. Now, right past the Willow Springs Hotel, though, the, uh, there would be a fork in the road. If you go straight, you would be staying on the old Route 30, or, the, or the, as we know it today, is the Chambersburg Pike over the Cashtown Pass. But if you go to the left, that's Hilltown Road today. But that is actually the roadbed of the old 1747 Road. And if you even get on uh, the old Route 30 today and you look down into the uh, into the Cashtown Pass, you will see this building down there, and that is the Tavern of Mary Brook. And uh, we got a close up here of it. Jacob Brook actually built this two-story stone house on the York Black Gap Road in 1803. Now, Mary uh, Brook will own this stone building and 300 acres in 1846, and she will receive a tavern license to operate a tavern, and she will run one here until 1858. She's actually listed on the tax records as the widow Brook. And uh, apparently, though, at the time of the Civil War, maybe it was a tavern or maybe not. Uh, the problem we have with the, the tavern licenses and applications uh, after 1851 and through the Civil War years is 
the applications have been lost. After 1851, we don't have any of the original applications. Now, we do have a list of who was uh, granted tavern licenses. We even know what you know township they were in. But unfortunately, it does not give their location. So if it was being used as a tavern right now, we're not quite sure who was there. Obviously, Mary, she didn't put in any damage claim for any liquor or alcohol. Her claim was only for two horses and 2,000 fence rails that were taken by the Confederates. So if it was a tavern, I don't know it's there, and maybe it wasn't a tavern at all at the time, but there is an old story. Apparently when uh, Jubal Early, he's going to actually take most of his division down the uh, downhill town road, the old road, going to actually through the, the floor of uh, the Cash Town Pass, and he's going to stop at this building on June the 26th, 1863. And he's actually going to cut out the center of a map of Adams County that hung behind the bar. Apparently, he needed a road map, so he takes out his pocket knife, he cuts it out, and folds it up, leaves, gets on his horse, and rides away. But it said that for many years, that old map hung on the wall. It's also said that Mary Brooke took a list of Confederate casualties and put them where the center of the map had been. Uh, the old tavern was uh, was being used, like I said, for a tavern, though we don't know who the proprietor was. The old tavern remained in possession of the Brooke family well into the 20th century, but today it is now serving as a private residence. Now, moving on, our next tavern we're going to be talked to. Of course, they would have passed the Cash Town Inn, but we had talked about that in part one. So the next uh, tavern would be this one right, right here, McKnight's Tavern. Captain Thomas McKnight, a veteran of the War of 1812, will build a mansion house on the Chambersburg Pike in 1823. And in 1826, he will apply for a tavern license, stating on his application that he was desirous of conducting a house of public entertainment. Another word for a tavern. McKnight will run his tavern for the next 25 years. Sometimes he runs it himself. Sometimes he also gets in a proprietor to run it for him. And after his death in 1851, his wife Margaret and his son will run the tavern. Now, in 1860, Hezekiah Latshaw will buy and repair the tavern. And with his associate, Jay Hartman, they will lay out the town of New Salem around the tavern. Unfortunately, there was already a town of New Salem in Fayette County. So in the post office, they want to establish a post office in 1863. They were quickly informed that there was already a town named New Salem in Fayette County. So what do we name our town? So they finally decided to call it McKnight's Town in honor of Captain Thomas McKnight. Now, during Jeb Stewart's raid into Adams County in October 1862, this is the closest he will come to Gettysburg because it was stated that he turned south at Latshaw's Tavern. He's on his way to Fairfield. Martin Miller, who would run the tavern from 1861 to 1863, would also put in a claim for lost merchandise and liquor during Lee's invasion. It was reported that from June the 28th to July the 4th, the rebels overran and ravaged the entire neighborhood. Liquor was taken out of the bar of the cellar of Martin Miller's hotel. Miller will file a damage claim for 20 gallons of whiskey and brandy. Not a lot if you look at the claims of some of these other people, but where he really gets hurt is what happened across the street. He had owned a saddler shop and the Confederates actually took all his tools and leather, so pretty much wiped that out for him. In 1866, Latshaw will sell his tavern to Jacob Nickley. This is the same Jacob Nickley who was running the Nickley Hotel or the Cash Town Inn, as it's known today, at the time of the battle as well. And, and he will in turn send it to, sell it to Samuel Eccles in 1867. Through the 1870s, it would be owned and run by George Washington Herb, and it would be known as Herb's Hotel. But today it is now a private residence. Just as a uh, side note, Captain McKnight's youngest son, Harvey, would serve in the Union Army during the Civil War, and he would serve in the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Infantry as its adjutant. And of course, the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Infantry was the unit that showed up in Gettysburg. And on June the 26th, just west of Gettysburg, they would be facing John Gordon's brigade. Discretion was the better part of valor, and of course, they uh, pretty much uh, skedaddled off the field. Unfortunately, later that day, they got overrun by the um, Virginia Cavalry, a place called Bailey's Hill, north of town. But uh, young Harvey, he survives that. After the war, he'd actually graduate from Pennsylvania College, and he would become the president of Pennsylvania College in 1884. 
And today, of course, Pennsylvania College is known as Gettysburg College. Uh, heading eastward now, uh, John Gordon and his boys are going to come past, the, or actually going to enter the little hamlet of Seven Stars, and they will see the Seven Stars Tavern. Now, George Arnold will build this tavern in 1817. He applied for his license in 1818, and uh, on his application, he would write the word new. And this kind of gives us an indication, if you're looking through these applications, that this is now a new tavern or a new stand. After George's death in 1824, though, his widow Elizabeth would be granted a license in April, and uh, she would actually only run it for about six months when she would marry a fellow by the name of Andrew Heinzelman. And Heinzelmans, uh, they'll actually own this tavern until 1866, but many a times they were also leasing it out. Now, the tavern had a sign out front with the constellation of the Pleiades, or as it's known, the uh, constellation of the Seven Sisters painted on it, and it uh, became known as the sign of the seven stars. Now, the hamlet, hamlet that grew up around the uh, tavern would become known as Seven Stars, a rather curious name. And there are three stories on why the tavern received this name, or the, even the, uh, the hamlet. Uh, one was that Heinzelman had seven daughters, and when people stopped in, he would have his daughters sing. And then he would remark, my seven little stars. Well, there are five towns in the United States named Seven Stars and uh, the Seven Daughter Story, and uh, that story is used in three of them. Uh, also, the fact that Heinzelman had no daughters to begin with makes that rather suspect. Stars have been used for years to donate excellence, so seven stars may be meant as a pure establishment. Four stars, maybe. Five stars, seven stars. Uh, that's a bit much. However, probably the real reason I found in a manuscript by L. Winkler in the Adams County Historical Society that states that the name came from the Delaware Indians who used the constellation, the Pleiades, and the Big Dipper in their astronomical references. And they had the seven stars in their folklore. This was probably picked up by the, uh, the local settlers and migrated westward with them. Now, um, after the Battle of Gettysburg, this tavern would be used as a Confederate field hospital. Uh, the Sanitary Commission map of 1863 shows the tavern as the hospital for Porcher's Division. They probably meant Pender's Division. But on Heinzelman's damage claim, he will state the house and barn were occupied about 10 days after the battle as a rebel hospital. He would also claim the loss of 6,000 shingles, 16 cords of wood, two wagons, and various crops. But no mention is made of any liquor. So as he did not have a license in 1863, either another proprietor was running it or is not being used as a tavern at the time of the battle. Heinzelman will sell his tavern in 1866 to Captain James Mickley. Mickley will also sell the tavern in turn in 1867 to Israel Little, and he will run it until 1876. Also, the tavern would serve as a post office for seven stars from 1862 to 1843. Again, as we had mentioned in our first program, it was very common a lot in those days to uh, locate the uh, post office in a tavern. Today, the building is still standing out on the uh, Chambersburg Pike, but it is a private residence today. Now, heading eastward, uh, Gordon would have passed Hers Tavern, which we did talk about um, on our uh, you know, program on part one, but now we're going to kind of deal with the taverns that uh, were existed in uh, Gettysburg at the time of the Civil War. And the first one I do want to talk about, and we didn't, we kind of mentioned his name in part one, but well, let's talk about his tavern here, and that is the Tavern of Samuel Gettys. Uh, Samuel Gettys will obtain a license to operate a tavern on the Nichols Gap Road in 1762. However, he was apparently operating his tavern before that because he was issued a tippling indictment and fine in 1761. Basically, he was selling his whiskey illegally. So that was actually fairly common in that time. It seemed the farther one was away from the center authority or the county seat, the less inclined the operators were to get a license until they were caught. In 1769, the Baltimore Shippensburg Road will cross the Nichols Gap Road near his tavern. Uh, matter of fact, a section of that, uh, they would actually use two taverns, Getty's Tavern and Black's Tavern, as reference points for this new section of this new road. Samuel Getty's is now at the crossroads of two very important roads in western York County, and his tavern will become the center of the community. At this time, uh, the Revolutionary War breaks out. There's been fighting up in uh, New England at Lexington and Concord, 
and it was decided that a company of riflemen should be raised in western York County and sent to join Washington's army in Cambridge, Massachusetts. On June the 24th, 1775, Captain Dowdle will recruit his company at Getty's Tavern. However, he's got a slight problem. More men have shown up than he needs. A decision has to be made on who would be accepted, and it was finally decided they should uh, have a shooting contest. Since this was going to be a rifle company, maybe they should accept only the best shots. So Captain Dowdle drew a profile of General Gage, the British Army commander in North America, and each man was uh, required to aim at General Gage's nose and see if he could hit it. Uh, he actually drew the profile on the door of the tavern. Now, the story doesn't say what Mr. Gettys thought about having his tavern door peppered with musket balls, but maybe it was a good kind of advertisement. Uh, between 1785 and 1786, Samuel's uh, son James, James Getty, and John Forsyth will lay out 210 lots around the crossroads and realign the road. So now this old tavern will actually be set back about 100 yards from York Street. Uh, James Gettys will build a new tavern on York Street in 1790, so the old building is no longer being used as a tavern, but it will continue to serve the community. When Adams County was established in 1800, the first county court sessions were actually held in the old tavern until the new courthouse was built uh, in the square in 1804. Now, during the Battle of Gettysburg, this old tavern is still standing. It was owned by Adam Dorsum. He was a blacksmith, so it survived the, uh, the battle. Unfortunately, though, uh, in 1880, there'll be a fire that will destroy the old tavern. Today, the uh, municipal parking garage is on the site right behind the Gettysburg Hotel. Now, James Gettys, Samuel's son, he's going to build this tavern in 1790. This is the Globe Inn. And it was stated it was, uh, might have been the first brick building here in Gettysburg. And Gettysburg will own his tavern until his death in 1815. His wife, uh, Mary Todd, was actually a distant relative of Mary Todd Lincoln. So there is a slight Lincoln connection here, even before the Civil War. William Gillespie would buy the inn. He'd operate and lease it until 1851 when he sells it to his son-in-law, Harvey Waddles. When the new courthouse was built on Baltimore Street in 1859, Waddles will donate the clock, which is still up there running today. In 1860, uh, Waddles will sell the globe to Charles Wills for $4,000. The Globe was actually the headquarters for the Democratic Party, where they would have their meetings and conventions. And on Election Day, if it was a Democratic victory, they would celebrate by a parade through town and usually wind up uh, at the Globe afterwards, probably celebrating. Uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg, Charles Will, his son John, will actually write about his experiences and what happened at the Globe during the battle. On the night of June the 26th, remember, Jubal Early and John Gordon are still marching across Adams County, three Louisiana Tigers showed up at the end. These were part of probably Hayes' brigade. They were just north of town. They made their way into the town, and they ordered Charles to give them three barrels of whiskey. Uh, he refused. Uh, probably not a good idea to refuse anything from a Louisiana Tiger. They were a fairly notorious outfit. So they drew their swords and uh, made him open the cellar. They took three bottles, but they said they'd be back in the morning to pay for it. Well, in the morning, a Confederate major shows up, and he gives Charles a receipt for the whiskey. Uh, probably didn't make Charles any happier. A uh, receipt was something that, in lieu of Confederate money, they'd give you a receipt. It basically gave you the fair market value of whatever it is they took. Uh, the deal was, after the war, you could go to Richmond and redeem that receipt for gold. Of course, that only works if the Confederacy wins. If they don't win, well, you got some guy's autograph on a piece of paper. But at least, in a way, the Tigers kept their word. After the Confederates left, Mr. Wills decided he was going to bury some of his whiskey barrels, kind of hide them in his garden, along with some groceries. Unfortunately, he didn't seem to plan well ahead because water seeped through the barrels and ruined the whiskey. But on July the 1st, the Globe is going to be doing a booming business selling whiskey to Union soldiers as they pour through the town. So remember, the 11th Corps is coming through the streets of Gettysburg, heading out to the fields north of town, and they're stopping at these taverns and inns looking for whiskey. So uh, Will's got a booming business. He's got two of his friends actually drawing whiskey out of barrels, putting him into the soldiers' canteen. When the fighting starts north of town, though, Union officers rush in and they quickly order the men out and they tell Will, stop selling liquor to the men. Well, then the officers left. 
And some soldiers came back and they started begging for whiskey again. So we'll start serving them until he's ordered again to stop. On July 2nd and 3rd, uh, actually, Confederate officers would dine at the Globe for breakfast. They'd have lunch and supper there as well. Probably the reason you know they're doing it is because it was a democratic establishment. And so they uh, start going there for their meals. And uh, they're actually paying Will with gold and uh, U.S. currency. And seeing a good thing, Will will raise the price of a meal from 35 cents to 50 cents. And whiskey went from a nickel to a dime. Because he was serving these Confederate officers, and maybe because it was a Democratic headquarters, some townspeople accused him of harboring rebels. He would clear himself of that charge with no problem, but several days later, he was brought up in front of the provost marshal again and reprimanded for selling too much whiskey to Union soldiers. In 1864, Samuel Wolfe will purchase the inn, and he is going to add the third story. Gives you a look at what it would have looked like after uh, Mr. Wills did his renovations. And uh, in 1890, changes the name to the Globe Hotel. Now, there was an article in the paper that on May the 30th, 1906, the first murder in Gettysburg occurred at the Globe when William Eiler killed Howard Miller with a pump handle. Both had been drinking at the Globe, and apparently there was some dispute over something. In 1928, the name is changed to the Hoffman Hotel, and the facade on York Street will be changed again. And over the next several decades, will be known as the Hoffman House, Sachs Apartments, Sherman Store. But on March 21st, 1968, the old inn would be destroyed by fire. Uh, today, there is a, uh, a commercial business on the spot. Now, moving along in town, we're going to move up to the square, and we're going to come to the McClellan House. Now, in 1797, James Scott will open a tavern on the northeast side of the Diamond. And when Scott dies in 1809, William McClellan Sr. will buy the tavern, and he will name it the Indian Queen. The McClellans were very active uh, in owning and operating taverns here in the area. And they had also one time owned Ackerman's Tavern, the Sign of the Buck, also the Black Horse Tavern on the Fairfield Road. But when William dies in 1814, John Hirsch will buy the tavern. He never operates it himself. He's another one who prefers to have other tavern keepers run it for him. And he will change the name to the Gettysburg Hotel. In 1816, a young attorney by the name of Thaddeus Stevens would have his law office in the east end of the hotel. In 1826, William McClellan Jr. will purchase the hotel from his father and Lord John Hirsch, and he will name it again the Franklin House. And he will own and operate the hotel until his death in 1845. In 1846, William's brother George will take over, and he will name it, rename it yet again, calling it the McClellan House. And that's the name it would be known for at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. In those days, the hotel actually served as a stagecoach stop for the Pittsburgh, Baltimore, and Philadelphia stages. And due to its proximity to the courthouse, which stood right in the middle of the diamond in those days, many attorneys would have their law offices in the hotel. Also, many doctors and dentists would set up temporary offices here periodically to serve their patients. And the hotel was actually the meeting place for the Whig and then the Republican parties. Now, on July the 1st, 1863, McClellan is doing a brisk business selling whiskey to Union soldiers. Again, they're hurrying through town, probably the 11th Corps boys. But the, house, the hotel itself would not be occupied by soldiers during the battle. He's not selling very many meals to Confederate officers. Imagine, matter of fact, they weren't even going to his establishment, maybe because they found out it was the Republican headquarters. After the battle, though, a small group of Sisters of Christian Charity would arrive in town and to tend the wounded, and the parlors of the hotel would be turned over to them for their use. On November the 19th, 1863, it'd be George McClellan who would provide a horse for President Lincoln to ride you know, up to the Na National Cemetery. Apparently, the, uh, the horse was rather uh, short, and they said Lincoln's feet almost touched the ground. Uh, the hotel was so full of people on the night of uh, November the 18th that the people were actually sleeping in the lobby and the bar. When George McClellan dies in uh, 1873, his uh, brother John will take over. He's going to add a third story to it. Here's another picture at the time. Uh, but he'll add a third story to that. And again, he prefers to have other managers and tavern keepers run it. The most notable of those men was a fellow by the name of Simon Diller. Now, Diller weighed over 300 pounds. He also had five brothers, and each of those boys weighed over 300 pounds. 
So the joke was when the family got together, they called they call those six boys a ton of Dillers. Diller would buy the hotel after McClellan's death in 1889, and he would name it the Hotel Gettysburg. And he will also extend it back to Racehorse Alley. So here is actually what it looked like as the Hotel Gettysburg. This was actually the uh, second hotel on the site. The first hotel, the McClellan House, was demolished in 1895. This is the new hotel that went up in 1895. And uh, actually, this building would be destroyed by fire in the 1960s. So the current Gettysburg Hotel on the square is actually the third structure that was standing in that location. Moving down Chambersburg Street, though, we're going to come to the Eagle Hotel. Today, that's on the corner of uh, Washington Street and Chambersburg Street. Today is a convenience store there. But in 1813, William Garvin will build a two-story brick building on Lot 74. And an early ad actually gave the dimensions. It said it was 64 feet wide by 70 feet deep and had 22 rooms. This would make it ideal for an inn. Philip Hagee and Jacob Sanders were the proprietors from 1825 to 1833. But in 1833, a James Thompson will purchase the tavern and it will become the Eagle Hotel. Thompson will actually use the Eagle as a hub for the stage lines he's running to Chambersburg and Harrisburg. John Tate will purchase the Eagle in 1850. In 1857, he will add a third story and a veranda, much like you see in the picture right here now. Tate was the proprietor in 1863 when the Confederates occupied the town, and they will help themselves to Mr. Tate's liquid refreshment. He will later submit a damage claim for whiskey, 20 gallons of his best brandy, 20 gallons of cognac, 20 gallons of ginger brandy, 60 gallons of gin, 60 gallons of cherry wine, 100 bushels of corn, 200 bushels of oats, two horses, two tons of hay. Alfred Scott, who was his witness on the damage claim and lived across the street, would write that on the claim that uh, he saw rebels rolling whiskey barrels out of the cellar, loading them onto wagons. Also, uh, on the night of June the 30th, the Eagle was actually the headquarters for John Buford before the, uh, the battle. And on the night of uh, June the 30th, a Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Dickinson of Meade's staff would visit Buford at the Eagle, and uh, they would actually be kind of sharing information and Dickinson is getting a first-hand account of what's occurring west of town and what Buford scouts have been reporting to him. He will ride back to 20 town and advise General Meade of what's happening up here, up ahead. George Hopps will take over in 1876, and he'll be actually succeeded by several others. But uh, finally, a fellow by the name of Henry Yingling will take over. Unfortunately, though, on January the 12th, 1894, a fire would break out in the hotel's stables on the west side of Washington Street. And due to almost gale force winds, the fire will spread to three other stables and finally to the roof of the hotel itself. The blaze was so severe, these embers are blowing all over town, that fire companies from as far away as Hanover, Waynesboro, and Hagerstown, Maryland, would come up by train to help fight the blaze. The uh, Eagle, however, was badly damaged. The roof caught fire, so the roof is totally burnt off, and the second and third floors are actually sagging due to water damage. On the plus side, though, the bar room and the wine cellar were untouched. So I guess if you're in a hotel and there's a fire, head for the bar. Uh, the hotel was rebuilt in 1894. And in 1896, George Eberhardt will per purchase it, and he will add a fourth floor and expand the hotel. So that by 1907, it'll have 165 rooms. And here's a picture of how it would have looked uh, after that addition here. So you can see it's... It goes back quite a ways. You've got four stories. Uh, on May 16th, 1913, on his last visit to Gettysburg, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain will stay at the Eagle. He was actually the main representative of the uh, commission that was planning the 50th anniversary later that year. Unfortunately, due to illness, Chamberlain would not be able to attend the reunion, but he was at the Eagle uh, that May. Uh, the hotel will continue to serve the public into the mid-20th century. Sometimes it would be known as the Adams House, the Eberhardt Hotel, and finally was converted into apartments. However, on June 30th, 1960, 66 years after the first fire, another blaze would destroy the old hotel. The remains were torn down in 1961. A gas station was originally on the, built on the site, but today a convenience store occupies the location.
The next tavern we're going to be talking about is the Washington Hotel. The picture you see here, this is the the only known picture of the Washington Hotel. Uh, luckily, we've enhanced it a bit. Uh, Antigone here has enhanced it, so we got a better view of it. But like I said, this is the only one we've got. It's kind of a shame, really. Because on August 29th, 1857, an ad appeared uh, in the Gettysburg Papers listing a dwelling for sale by the owners, David McConaughey and John Horner. Israel Yount will purchase the building in 1857, and he will open it as the Washington Hotel in 1858. Located across the street from the new train station, the Washington will be very popular with travelers. When rail service begins in December 1858, a temporary ticket office will be located in the parlor of the hotel until the new station opens in May 1859. Even after the station opened, the bar at the Washington will remain a favorite waiting area for travelers. On February 1st, 1859, a newspaper ad advertised the pub to the public that Israel Yount was the proprietor of a new house and that it was the finest, best furnished house in the interior of the state. Mr. Yount was doing fine until the summer of 1863 when the Civil War came to Gettysburg. On June 30th, 1863, General Buford's Union Cavalry arrived into town and that evening uh, the streets were filled with Union Cavalrymen. Israel Yount's young seven-year-old daughter, Emma, was playing outside when one of the soldiers, who was sitting on her doorstep, asked her to come and talk with him. He told her that he had a little girl at home and that on the coming day, a great battle would be fought and he might not see his little girl again. He asked her if she would kiss him for his daughter's sake. Emma asked her mother if she could do this, and her mother said that under the circumstances, she could, and she did. The soldier then gave her a beautiful silk handkerchief, the border which was striped in red, white, and blue, and the center was a picture of George Washington. Emma kept that treasure the rest of her life and always wondered if the soldier ever got home to his little girl. Today, that handkerchief is in the possession of the Adams County Historical Society. On the morning of July the 1st, 1863, Yount and his family will leave the hotel and will take be taken over for, by Dr. James Farley of the 14th Brooklyn Infantry. He would set up a field hospital here and 50, 60 men of the 14th Brooklyn who had been wounded on the morning fight just west of town would be brought here for medical attention. On the afternoon of the 1st, hotel would be in the firing line. Confederate artillery north of town was firing into the town and that building would be hit, hit twice by artillery fire. One round actually took off the thigh and thumb of one of the hospital attendants. Dr. Farley, though, will stay, and uh, he would treat the wounded throughout the battle. An ad ran on November the 2nd, 1877, by I.B. Hauser, listing the 26-room hotel for sale. The hotel continues operation well into the 20th century, but it's very run down, and finally, it would be torn down in 1926 to make way for a new bus terminal. An article in the Gettysburg Times on January the 20th, 1926, described the end of the ho old hotel, it also said that the old train station across the street should be replaced as well because it had become an eyesore. Uh, basically, they're talking about the historic Lincoln train station across the street. Luckily, uh, that had been uh, has been restored, and today you can see it. But today, the uh, Washington Hotel uh, is now occupied by the Lincoln Diner. That's the silk handkerchief that was given to Emma, Emma Yount uh, by that unknown Union soldier on the evening before the battle. Again, it's uh, in the possession of the Adams County Historical Society. Now, the next uh, tavern we're going to talk about on our tour is the Wagon Hotel. In 1821, John Espy will build a two and a half story brick hotel at the intersection of the Baltimore Pike and Emmitsburg Road. It would be a large yard on the Baltimore Pike side for parking wagons. Espy's Hotel would cater to the wagon train and Teamsters. Remember in part one, we had talked about these taverns have certain clientele. Some cater to the stage trade, other to the wagoneers, and some to the drovers and herders. So this becomes a wagon, wagon hotel. The advertisement in the Gettysburg Compiler on May 23, 1821 read, John Espy has opened a public house of entertainment at the south end of the borough of Gettysburg in the fork of the Baltimore Pike and Emmitsburg Road, where wagoneers and others may be conveniently accommodated and on modern terms. Other proprietors will op operate the hotel continuously until 1837 when Conrad Schneider will buy it. Schneider will own the hotel until his death until, until 1860. 
and sometimes he operates it himself, but again, leasing it at other, at other times to other proprietors. Uh, after his death, the ownership would pass to his widow, Catherine, and his son-in-law, David Blueball, would be the proprietor from 1862 to 1865. Now, during the Battle of Gettysburg, the size and location of the hotel on the Union battle line would make this a primary location for snipers and sharpshooters occupying the windows. They would even punch holes in the roof so they could fire at Confederate troops uh, in the town of Gettysburg. Company B of the 73rd Pennsylvania would occupy the hotel on the afternoon, July the 1st, until the morning of the 2nd, when they would be replaced by men of Coster's Brigade. After the battle, David Bluebaugh would submit a damage claim for 38 gallons of whiskey, 5 gallons of brandy, 8 gallons of gin, 4 gallons of applejack, 12 gallons of wine, 18 gallons of cherry brandy. And these were all probably liberated by the Union soldiers because they were in the hotel. Conrad Snyder's two sons would also serve in the Union Army, and both would be captured during the war. One would be sent to Libby Prison and the other to Andersonville. But luckily, both would survive. And after the Civil War, the old hotel would be expanded and renamed the Battlefield Hotel from 1878 until 1883. Peter Thorne, the uh, husband of Elizabeth Thorne, well known for uh, the caretaker in the uh, Evergreen Cemetery, he would actually run the tavern at the hotel. And the old building would be destroyed by fire, though, in 1894. But the owner, L.C. Brunreuter, I hope that pronouncing that right, Brunreuter, will immediately build a new Battlefield Hotel on the site. So there is the new Battlefield Hotel, as it would have looked after, uh, you know, the fire. And here's another view of it. They're all kind of decked out on uh, July the 4th. Uh, that hotel will operate for many years until it is finally demolished to make way for a garage. Today, there is a uh, Sheets convenience store on the site right there. The last tavern we're probably going to be talking about today, as was when we get into the town of uh, Gettysburg, is the Fonstock. It's no, pretty much known today as the Fonstock Store. Uh, that's what it was at the time of the battle. But actually, this building starts life as the Spread Eagle Tavern. This tavern is located on the northwest corner of Baltimore and Middle Street. So the street in the foreground is Middle Street, heading west. And the street in front of the uh, the tavern there, that would be Baltimore Street today. The uh, Adams County Courthouse would be to the left off of the picture. And it would be operated by Bernard uh, Gilbert in 1814. Gilbert was quite prosperous. He owned several houses and lots in town, as well as 150 acres in Cumberland Township. Unfortunately, though, he would run into financial problems and lose everything in 1827. The new owner was the Bank of Gettysburg. Now, they will lease the tavern until 1833 to various proprietors, but Samuel Fonstock acquires it in 1833, and he would actually place an ad in the Sentinel in uh, July the 23rd, 1833, notifying the public that he's moving his store to Lot 11 in the building lately occupied by Major Jacob Sanders, which was the last proprietor of the Spread Eagle. In its day, the Spread Eagle Tavern was very popular with the jurors coming into town for court sessions, and they would dine and stay in the tavern overnight. A Fonstock and his heirs will run or lease a store in this location, so it's no longer being used as a tavern. It's now a, basically a mercantile. And during the Civil War, there was an observatory on the roof of the building. On July the 1st, 1863, Daniel Skelly, whose father was running the store, led General Oliver Otis Howard up to the observatory so he could familiarize himself with the terrain. And while uh, up there in the observatory, Howard would learn from an aide that General Reynolds had been killed and that he was now in command of Union forces on the field. After the war, the building continued as a store, and in 1892, there was a place called the Wide Awake Oyster Saloon was in the building. Then it reverts back to a store, and the building is still standing today. It's been expanded somewhat, but it is being used for senior housing. One other place I would mention, uh, I don't have a picture of it here, but you're probably familiar with it, is the Wills House right on the square in Gettysburg. It is actually part of the National Park uh, here at Gettysburg. But uh, actually, uh, that building was actually put up in uh, 1816. Captain Alexander Cobain will build that third story brick building uh, that year. He actually replaced a one story stone house that stood there. 
When he goes bankrupt in 1823, the Bank of Gettysburg will own the property. They list it out mostly to merchants. But in 1839, an A.B. Kurtz would move in, and an ad in the Sentinel on April 1st, 1839, ran A.B. Kurtz removing from his old stand at the Globe Inn and now taking up the American Hotel in a three-story house on the southeast corner of Diamond, lately occupied as a store. So A.B. Kurtz now has the American Hotel operating in the square in Gettysburg. Uh, on April the 1st, 1859, David Wills will purchase the building, and this would be his residence, and he would be here at the, you know, at the time of the battle. And also, this would be the building where Abraham Lincoln would stay on the night of November the 18th, 1863. And Wills and his heirs would own that building until 1895. And like I said today, the building is owned by the National Park Service. Uh, they have restored the room where Lincoln stayed, and they also have a nice uh, little diorama of the town of Gettysburg as it looked in 1863 at the time of the battle. And that concludes part two of our historic inns and taverns of Gettysburg. Thank you, John, for that interesting new perspective on the Battle of Gettysburg. And our thanks to the Dobbin House for supporting our programs. Good evening. <music>